like second service because second service are usually the ones who are like, you know what? I'm just so passionate about being in the presence of God. I don't want to have any time constraints. I'm here to be here until like six o'clock tonight, right? Is that why you guys chose second service? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the, for the, the wonderful introduction. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> this is a great church. We, we travel, we get to be in a different ministry, different church. Almost every week we're in a different place or ministry of some sort. And, and as we travel, we get to really see like the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all, right? We've seen all different types of spectrums. And, and I think God's hand is, is, has his grace for for every church, but uh, specifically this church uh, is not the bad or the ugly. This church is the good. Amen? Amen. Uh, you guys could do better than that, right? Just turn on. Right. Amen. And, and that's because of, of your pastors, right? And so we're so thankful for you guys, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Amber. How many of you guys are thankful for your pastors? Yeah, thankful for your lives, your ministry, and uh, Isaiah and Everett, you know, as well. And they... You know, you think about it. Pray for the, pray for their your pastor. I need to pray for your pastor. Pray for their kids too. Amen. Uh, so again, we're, we're we're grateful to be here. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun. If you're joining us online, thank you for for taking time to to be here and spend your Sunday morning uh, with us. I heard somebody recently call like the online online audience the digital disciples, and I kind of want to adopt that. So welcome, digital disciples. Uh, we're glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, Pastor said uh, that we had a resource table out there for you. Let me just uh, give you a, a, an idea of one of these uh, resources that we have. This is called uh, Your Guide to Not Be Stupid. Anybody ever done anything stupid before? Okay, three of us. The rest of us are doing something stupid by lying in church at the moment, right? Uh, this is a guide to help people get into the Word of God. It looks at the book of Proverbs over their 31-day period. It takes a proverb a day, tells a, a story or some type of illustration, talks uh, through the Word of God. Because how many of you know, uh, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And if we could have more wisdom of God, we'd do less foolish and stupid things. Amen? Uh, the power of God is so is so real. Our uh, fellowship, the Assemblies of God, um, they did a study with a research group called Barna, and they found that people who read their Bible four or more times a week are 400% more likely to share their faith with somebody. It's a good thing, right? We should probably be sharing our faith there. They are 200% more likely to memorize scripture. How many know you don't always have the time to like Google, hey Google, give me a verse on like how to overcome temptation. The Bible says we need to have the word of God hidden in our heart, right? You are 67% less likely if you read your Bible four or more times a week to participate in uh, like, uh, what's it called? Like, Abuse of substances like alcohol and different substances. So 67% less likely. You're 43% less likely to have feelings of loneliness. And so if we would just get in the word of God, we already have such a higher opportunity for victory in our lives. And I read a final statistic, which was like the end of it for me, was it says that 60% of self-profession Christians uh, don't read their Bibles. And when I read 60% of self, I was really glad that they said self-professing, right? Because I feel like there's a really strong disconnect between saying I'm a Christian and not reading my Bible. And I understand that it's challenging to get in your Bible, which is why we wrote this guide to help people get into the Word of God. Because we know if you get in the Word of God, it's going to change your life. Amen? So if you want to copy that, we'd love for, for you to have it. As Pastor mentioned, we were here uh, a few years ago. When I was here last time, though, uh, we were a family of three, and now we're a family of four. How many of you things got real, real in our house? Amen? We're playing man defense now, uh, so pray for us. I want to introduce you to my family quickly, if I can. Everybody say, oh. All right. The newest addition to our family is the one that I'm holding, uh, or my wife is holding, excuse me. His name is Alessio. Everybody say, Alessio. Lewis. Namdi Baralato. What's his name? He's got the Namdi. Okay, okay, okay. That was, that, was, that was better than first service. I guess first service didn't have their coffee or whatever. Alessio is pretty awesome. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's a bit of a bully. It's okay, because God's going to use it for his glory. Somebody say amen. Right? So we get the rolling greens. We're just going to shape him into who God wants him to be. Love him. He's a, a lot of fun. If you can get through the, like, the, 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 the bully element of him, you're going to get the sweetest kid in the world. Uh, the one that I'm holding, her name is Ayela. Say Ayela. Rema. Adeze. Baralato. What's her name? Like, like y'all knew it was coming too. So I don't know. I mean, I get you. The first one I get, you know, still waking up. But this one, you knew it was coming. Anyway, Ayala, she's pretty amazing. Her name means whirlwind. 
Uh, Ayala means whirlwind. So like if you're like putting bids in for your grandchild's next name or what you're thinking about what you're gonna name your next child, I would go with like peace, tranquility, you know, one of those submissive, all those good words that we want in children. Uh, she's been living up to it. She's a bit of a wild woman for Jesus. I love to brag on her. She's pretty cool. The other day she was at school and she asked her teacher what church she went to. And uh, her teacher said that she didn't go to church. And she said, well, you better start going to church because Jesus is coming back. Amen? Yeah. So we're here for that. Like, I'm all about it. I'll encourage that. Uh, so she's a, a, lot, a lot of fun. It, it's been great. And then uh, let's be real. Those two, a few years, they're out of here. And uh, we get to live our lives in peace once again. Uh, my wife, uh, who is here on the front row, and uh, everybody say hi, Shari. Fun fact about Shari is today is her birthday. I know. Like she doesn't have to hear my mouth enough. She's got to hear it on her birthday. Amen. So pray for her. She's awesome. Spend some time with her. Ladies, if you were here, did you guys have a good time yesterday? Amen. Cool. Well, we're going to have a good time again today. Uh, yesterday, I know that she spoke about peace, but uh, our world uh, is always doubling down on negativity. Everything you open up, it's, it's bad news. It's not positive uh, for the most part, right? So we're going to be talking today about peace again, okay? So is, there, is it okay if we double down on peace? Can you wave at me? The world double down, doubles down on negativity. We're going to double down on peace. I'm jumping into your series here, which uh, he will be called, and today our, our topic is peace. And so, uh, as Pastor mentioned, you know, we, we, we're traveling. Uh, we get to do some really cool stuff. In, in uh, January, we're going to be in San Jose, California, ministering at a church there, and it's going to be, be a lot of fun. But as we were, we were making our plans and all this, I was doing a little bit of research about, like, what is there to do in San Jose, right? If we get some free time, what can we go to do? So there's some pretty cool stuff. There's, like, this IMAX theater that goes over your head too. Have you guys seen that? That would be pretty cool. But there's one that I thought was super interesting. It's called the Winchester Mansion. Has it, wait, if you've ever heard of the Winchester Mansion before, a, a few of us. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about the Winchester Mansion. Here's, here's a picture of it. First of all, can we do the overhead picture? Look at, the, look at the, how big this is. Is that crazy or what? So this is the Winchester Mansion. It's in San Jose, California. Thousands and thousands of people go there every year to just see, to see how, how kind of crazy it is, honestly. In this house, there are more than 10,000 windows. There's more than 160 rooms. It's nuts. For 38 years, Sarah Winchester, who is the spouse or was the spouse of the man who invented the Winchester rifle. You ever heard of the Winchester rifle before? So she's the owner of this house. And for 38 years, she spent in modern day money $70 million. Yeah, $70 million on building this house. And so for 38 years straight, she had teams of carpenters in there, teams of contractors, teams of masons, and day in and day out, without taking days off, they worked. And the reason that she did this is because she believed that as long as there was construction happening in her house, the ghosts of the people her husband's rifles had killed couldn't haunt her anymore. And so, and so we're all laughing a little bit, a little bit about that, right? But she thought that she could find peace as long as she continued to work and continued to build. It got so crazy that they began to build stairwells to nothing. Look at this picture of this stairwell here. Look where that stairwell leads. To nothing. And it's interesting what we will do in our search for peace. We will spare no expense in our search for peace. And let me just say this. Peace cannot be purchased. We, we can spend money to get comfortable. We can get money to change our, our outward circumstances. But peace is something that happens on the inside. And no amount of money, no $70 million, no hallways, no 10,000 windows, no 160 rooms is going to give you a peace on the inside. We look to things and we try to build paths to find inner peace and these things that are going on in our hearts. But ultimately, they all end up like this picture, leading to nothing. No relationship, no amount, accumulation of wealth, no adventure, no like taking on to the next thing. I know a lot of us like to just get the next adventure and on to the next thing, but none of these things are going to lead to peace. And so I want to talk to you today about that. In a season, a Christmas, a holiday season, this should be the time where people are the most peaceful, right? 
Like we're, we're, we're thankful for this and that. How many thankfulness brings peace in your heart, right? We're, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. And if this season is supposed to be so peaceful, why are there so many people who are committing suicide in this season? Right? This is the highest suicide rate of the holidays. The holidays tend to be the, the, the seasons of life that have the least amount of peace. We think about all the things that happened in our past. We think about our crazy family members that we're going to have to see again. I just saw them in, thanks, in November. Why do I have to see them in December too? Right? Like I see them twice a year. It's on those two. You know, could have spread them out, right? You can take this picture down. And, uh, and, and that's the reality of it. It's, it. it's not peaceful. And let me just say this. If you're not walking in peace, if you don't have a peace in your heart, no matter the circumstances in your life, in, in a really loving but direct way, I just want to say that you're outside of God's calling for your life. The Bible says that you were called to peace. Look what Colossians says. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 13, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. You and I are called to be people of peace. We are called to live a life of peace, not just with the people around us, like as one body he's talking about here, but we're as individuals supposed to be marked by peace. And if we're not marked by peace, what has begun to take place is we have allowed something else to rule in our hearts. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. I'm just going to say this, that we let something rule our hearts. We all have a decision to make. Who, what, what thing, what circumstance is going to rule our hearts. That's why he says, let it happen. We have a choice in what takes place in our hearts. That's why the Bible teaches us what? To guard your hearts. And so you and I, if we're not experiencing peace it's, peace, it's probably because we've allowed something else to come, rest and rule in our hearts. Think about that word rule. That word rule means that something or someone or a circumstance has authority and ownership in that space. Let me just say this. The only thing that has authority and ownership in my heart should be Jesus Christ. That's why he says, let Christ rule in your hearts. Let his peace rule in your hearts. We just read this verse on, on the giving talk, which says that he's the ruler of all things, right? But let me just say this about that verse. He's only the ruler of your heart if you let him. He rules everything else, but there's one thing he can't rule unless he has permission to rule, and that's your heart. That's my heart today. So we have to make a choice to say, God, you are going to do it. The Apostle Paul is talking to them there, and if I could summarize it, this is how I would summarize it. I'd summarize it by Paul saying this. Look, Make a decision to allow the person of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to have authority and ownership over your heart. That is God's plan and calling for your life. Do you agree that God's plan and calling on your life is for him to have authority and peace in your hearts? Do you agree with that today? Good, because that's his plan for you. I, I feel like, uh, my, my wife's going to laugh when I say this, I feel like an angel today. Don't say nothing. Luke chapter 2 in the Christmas story says this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. The angel comes and is just declaring peace over the people whose favor is resting upon them. I just didn't feel like I'm here today to declare peace over your heart. I'm going to declare peace over your mind today that God wants to rule and reign in your heart. And he's going to give you this peace. Do you receive that peace today? Come on, do you receive that today? It says, for, for those on whom his favor rests. Look at somebody say, you're favored by God. Come on, you know how I know that you're favored by God? Because you're in the presence of God right now. There's people out there who aren't in the presence of God right now. A marker that you're favored by God is that you're here today, that you're watching online today. The favor of God is with you. Let his peace be with you as well. Say amen. Let's pray. I know I started out a little hot. I'm going to pray and calm down a minute. Jesus, we love you. Give us your peace today. Amen. Now, I'm a firm believer in that the Bible teaches that there is a time and a season for everything, right? Like the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is a time for, for reaping and there's a time for harv or sowing, right? So, so the Bible says, like, hey, if you plant something in the wrong season, you're not going to get the crop that you're expecting to get, correct? Or if you try to reap something that isn't quite mature yet to reap, what you're going to do is you're going to destroy the crop. It's a biblical principle that there's a time and a season for everything. So all of you should agree with me that there is a time and a season in which it is appropriate to set up your Christmas tree. And it's not before Thanksgiving. 
Amen? Somebody, she's going to shout me. It's okay to shout me down. Anybody? Amen? Look at your spouse and say, listen to the preacher. All right? There's a time and a season which is appropriate. And, you know, with that whole Christmas tree thing, I was on board with it until this year. This year, my wife and I and my kids and I, we all moved to Frederick. She, she took a new role in the church. Amazing. She's killing it because she's the best. And anyway, we're at, we moved to this church. We moved to this house in Frederick. It's a pretty cool, awesome house. We thought it was great, perfect for us, and it is. And then uh, a Halloween season came around. October 1st came around. And what we noticed, we're in a townhouse, is the person, three doors, three doors, right? Three doors next to us, right? Three doors next to us is all about this Halloween thing, okay? Like, I'm cool. Do a pumpkin, whatever. Do your pumpkin. Do your little cartoon thing. Fine. But she took it to another level. This woman has got, I kid you not, she had an altar with a pentagram on it. She had a demon in her doorway. It got, it like, it was a whole other level, y'all. So, so pray for her, okay? Pray for her. <laughs> and pray for us, because God wants to use us to change her heart. Amen? So anyway, long story short. We had to see this for the whole month of October. And I know that there's an appropriate time and an appropriate season to put your Christmas tree up. But you know what we did on Halloween this year? We put the Christmas tree up. Amen. Thank you. I knew I could get one or two. I could get some help from somebody around here. Come on. We put the Christmas tree out. We grabbed a garland. We did hot chocolate and marshmallows. We did the Christmas carols. We put the fake bonfire on the TV. Anybody else do that? Come on. We were all in for Christmas on Halloween this year. And there's an appropriate time and appropriate season for everything. I believe this verse that I'm about to read to you only gets brought up around Christmas time. And I get there's an appropriate time, appropriate season. I get all that. But I feel like this verse is not something that we should only read in December. I feel like this verse is something that we should meditate on throughout our year because this verse is not just a simple verse on the page. How many know the Word of God is alive and it's active? It doesn't die January through November and wake back up in December. Hello? Come on, this word of God is alive. Isaiah 9, 6 says this. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called, I love this, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Prince of peace. I, I love this verse so much because this was not just a prophetic declaration of who the Messiah would be, this is a prophetic declaration of what the Messiah would do. Come on, he says, my name is Prince of Peace. I, that's just not who I am, but that's what I do, is I come and I rule and I reign with peace. I give you peace in your heart. The names of God are not just defining who the, he is, it's his job description. Come on, so when I say that he is Jehovah Rapha, he's not just a God who heals, no, he's the God who heals me. Come on, he's God my healer. When I say he's Jehovah Jireh, he's not just a God who provides. No, he's a God who provides for me. That's his name, but it's also his job. It's also his description. The Bible says this, that those who know his name will trust in him. Those who know your name trust in you. The names of God are a pretty big deal. And if we're walking in a season of life where there's no peace, don't you think that we probably just need a little bit more trust in God? In, in times of life where there's a ton of chaos and a ton of turmoil and unrest, don't we just need more trust in God? So when we know his name, we can actually trust in him. Like, like I have no peace right now because my money's looking funny. But I know his name, so I choose to trust him. He's Jireh, my provider, right? He's going to provide every single one of my needs. Once I was young, now I'm old. Never once have I seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Somebody say amen. Come on. My marriage is on the rocks right now, so I have no peace. But guess what? I know his name, so I choose to trust him. He is the rock of my salvation, right? He's going to steady my marriage. He's going to steady me. He took me out of the miry clay and set my feet on a... Come on, solid rock. You don't know where to go. You don't know what you're going to do, what the next step of your life is. You're feeling all mis disheveled and misplaced. That's all good. I know his name, so I choose to trust him. He is the good shepherd who will lead me in paths of righteousness. Come on. I know his name, so I choose to trust him. I just speak over you all right now. The name of God is going to see you through this in the name of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 says this. It says that he makes his son to rise 
on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. And what's interesting about this verse is it's almost always uh, mentioned like, like rain is, and storms are almost always mentioned as a bad thing in life, aren't they? And even in this verse, when I hear this, well, the unjust and the just, like God's going to send his rain on the unjust. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe God is saying the rain is a good thing. Maybe God is saying like, hey, if I don't, if it don't rain, you're not going to get any harvest today. Maybe the storms in life are actually not always a bad thing for us. What, what determines the level of peace in a storm is your perspective. What are you choosing to look at this season of life at? Are you choosing to look at this season of life as, oh, the God's against me, the devil's winning, all this and that? Come on, no. I'm going to say, you know what? God is shaping me. God is forming me. God is setting us up to see the hand move mightily. Our perspective is everything. You want to know how you can tell which perspective you're leaning into? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart... The mouth speaks. So if God is saying, if, if Paul is saying, let Christ Jesus rule in your heart, what's coming out of our mouth should be words of faith. They should be words of not giving glory to the enemy, but praising God in the victory, in advance for the victory. Does that make sense? Whatever's in your heart will manifest out of your mouth. So what has been manifesting out of your mouth recently? Has it been words of faith and words of saying, you know what, I know his name, I'm going to trust him. Things look crazy right now, but I know his name, so I'm going to trust him. I just pray that trust is like rising up in your heart today. An ability to trust him, those things are absolutely crazy. <laughs> what I have found in my years of following Jesus uh, is this, that following Jesus will lead you through seasons of miraculous right into seasons of complete madness. Like, like that's just the reality of following Jesus. Like one day you're walking, everything is great, God is showing up, you have the most amazing time of devotion, the presence of God just meets you over that hot cup of coffee, somebody say amen. And then you get in the car and 30 minutes later you get a phone call and life is out of control in one phone call. You get a report from the doctor in a moment. Everything is gone. Every bit of peace that you had in the start of the day is gone instantaneously with one phone call. That's the reality of life. If we think that following Jesus means that we get a get out of chaos card, that's, that's not the reality. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Jesus said, in this world you will have challenges. But then he said what? Be of good cheer or take heart. I would say have peace. Because he has overcome the world already. There's a story in Mark chapter 6. Pretty cool story. Uh, most of you guys have probably heard this story. Let me summarize what's happening. Uh, Jesus and his disciples have a powerful day of ministry. They get tired. And so Jesus is like, all right, let's do this. Let's get on this boat. Let's push off. Let's get alone so we can get some space. What happened was everybody around them saw them get in the boat. And the Bible says that they began to run after Jesus on foot. This man is on a boat, but they're running after him on foot. And let me just say this. They didn't have any New Balance or Hulkas to be chasing him with. Amen? Come on. Them jokers are in sandals and barefooted going after Jesus. So what is stopping us from going after Jesus? Whole nother sermon. Whole nother sermon. So anyway, when Jesus comes back and they land, all the crowds and villages had come out and they saw Jesus. And then so Jesus, the Bible says that he had compassion on them. So what he began to do was to teach them. And so throughout the day, Jesus is there compassionately teaching them the things of God. And then the disciples come and they interrupt Jesus. And they're like, Jesus, your sermon was supposed to be 28 minutes. You were, we have to do announcements. We have to take offer. We got a lot of things we got to do in this service still. So they cut Jesus off, right? That's not really what happened. But what happens is they kind of say, hey, they've been with us a long day. We got to feed these. Send them home. Tell them to come back. And then, they, then uh, you, can, you can pick up. And Jesus was like, well, you feed them. And they were like, okay, how are we going to do that? Chick-fil-A is closed because it's Sunday, obviously, right? So they can't feed them. So Jesus famously says, you go and feed them. So they go around. They find what? Five loaves and two fish. Jesus groups them out in groups of 50s and 100s. He has them sit down. He begins to bless the food. He breaks it. And how many know every single one of them were fed? And the Bible says that they were still 12 baskets of food left over. Excuse me. Look how it says here. Mark 6, 45 through 46. Verse 44 says, the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Verse 45, immediately... Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of them to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd after leaving them. 
he went up on a mountainside to pray, and later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. So earlier in the day, they see Jesus feed 5,000 with two loaves, or five loaves and two fish, right? And then immediately Jesus is like, yo, get in this boat, go over there, we got something we got to do. And then the same night, that night, now they have a storm against them. Now they're wondering if they're even going to survive this moment. Now they're even wondering if God was even going to deliver them through it. He says that, <clears throat> and what you notice here, that Jesus said to go across. It wasn't that they had made a big mistake, that they had sinned in some major way. Sin will definitely steal every ounce of peace in your life. Don't get me wrong on what I'm saying here. If you're living a life of sin, you'll never have peace with God, and you'll never have peace with, peace with your spouse. You'll never have peace with your kids. I didn't say this last service, but I feel, feel like I should mention this. If you're living in a lifestyle of sin, you're not going to have peace. Sin is an enmity with God. It's against God. And if God is the one who is the ruler of our hearts, if God is the Prince of Peace, if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and we're sinning against him, how can you have peace? Moving on. Jesus says to his disciples to go across. Jesus, do you think Jesus didn't know that they were going to hit a major storm? The one who was all-knowing, the one who spoke the earth into existence. I think Jesus knew that when they got into that boat, they were going to hit a storm. Do you not think that too? So he sees them and he sends them. Not every storm is coming from our lifestyle's decisions. Sometimes just following Jesus go from miracles to madness. So what Jesus gives while going through storms is his peace. Verse 48 goes on to say that he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the, the wind was against them. And think about that verse right there. They were straining at the oars. I can just imagine the disciples who are, let me just say this, they're not new to boats. They're not new to lakes. Like that. some of these men made livings by fishing lakes like this, okay? So they weren't new to figuring out how to manage a lake, right? But I can just picture them, they're just rowing, their arms are dead tired, their backs dead tired, it's worse than the concept, two rower, anybody use one of them things? Nobody, nobody uses the rower machine in here? Okay, or I'm the only one. I haven't used it in a while, can you tell? Anyway. They're doing everything. Their anxiety is through the roof. Their trust in God is at an all-time low. Like, they don't think that they're going to see their ways through this. All they can see is the storm around them. And I'm wondering if you feel like you're in that same place today. And if you do feel like that, I want to encourage you with the word here. It says that Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars. Jesus is not unaware of what you're going through. Jesus is not unaware of your circumstances. He's not unaware of your, what you're walking through. The Bible says that Jesus has compassion on people and then he begins to move. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And so then he begins to move. Whenever Jesus has compassion on somebody, it means he's getting ready to move. It means he's getting ready to act. The Bible says that he, when he saw compassion on them, so he fed them. He saw the woman, and the Bible says that he had compassion on her because her son had just died. And what did he do? He raised her from the dead, raised her son from the dead. Whenever God has compassion on somebody, he moves, and he sees you in this season of life. He's not, not missing you. The question is, are you missing him? He sees what you're walking through. He sees what you're going through. And the disciples here, the Bible says this. It says that shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake, and he was about to pass them by. Get, get this picture. He sees them on the lake. They're striving. They're straining, wondering if they're ever going to get through. He sees them. So he says, you know what? I see what's happening out there. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to do this. You know what they were trying to do? They were trying to win a spiritual battle by using natural means. They're striving. They're doing everything that they knew to do in the natural. But Jesus is saying, look, they're obviously not getting it. This is a spiritual thing. And let me just say this. Peace is a spiritual thing. Peace is not an outward thing. It's an inward spiritual thing. It's something that happens in our spirit. So here's Jesus. He sees them straining, and he just, he just, he just walks, walks on by. Right? You guys don't know the James Taylor song, The Walking Man? And The Walking Man Walks. Nobody knows it. You guys are too safe to know that song. Don't play with me. What do you all know that song, right? Thank you. So then he walks on by. And I wonder... If that was it, like if Jesus would have just missed them, thankfully, they got their eyes off of the storm and on Jesus and didn't miss him. But I wonder if Jesus would have kept going 
and just got to the other side and been like, well, they, they missed it. I don't think that's the Jesus that I serve. I think the Jesus that I would have served would have walked past them and been like, you know what? They missed it. Let's try this again. So then he's going to come by and see if they, see if they notice him today. Nope, they, they missed me again. So Jesus is going to going to what? He's going to walk by again. I think that Jesus would have walked past them as many times as it took for them to notice him. And I wonder in your season of life where there is no peace in your life, have you missed Jesus? If you have, it's okay because today he's walking by. Today he's walking by and he's just saying, could you, could you get your eyes off of down here? Could you get your eyes up a little bit higher? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Come on, this is a spiritual thing that I'm talking about. The Bible says that our weapons that we have are not carnal, but they're mighty and pulling down strongholds. We have a spiritual battle that we're in for peace today. And Jesus is saying, if you get your eyes off the natural and start to set them on the eternal, then something might begin to shift in your heart. That's why the Apostle Paul says this. He says, outwardly we are perishing, but in Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. The storm that you're in, I'm telling you right now, is temporary. I was in a six-year addiction to heroin. Guess what? It was temporary. When I got my eyes on something greater than me, when I got my eyes off of the storm and on Jesus, I found deliverance. Why? Because that's who he is. I know his name so I can trust him. Come on, he wants to do the same for you. Can you stand with me? Let me wrap up really quickly here. When they got their eyes off of the storm and they noticed Jesus walking on by, the Bible says that Jesus got into the boat with them and then immediately the storm ceased. Now, I'm not saying that you get with Jesus today and that every circumstance on the outward in your life is going to stop. But what I can guarantee is if you get with Jesus today, the storm on the inside of you is going to stop. You're going to have peace today. He is the Prince of Peace. His name shall be called Peace. Pastor Bobby mentioned a verse uh, in, in, his, uh, in his exhortation uh, for prayer this morning. And he, it was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, which says, Therefore, uh, those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new, right? And so if you are in a season where there is no peace, we need God to shift that up. We need, we need something new to begin to take place. The Bible says that before Jesus, we were not at peace. We were actually at war with God. We didn't have peace with God because of the lives that we had chosen to live. But because of Jesus, we can now not only have peace with God, but we can have peace with our past. We can have peace with our present. We can have peace with our future, knowing how this thing is going to end out when we are with God. Correct? So how do we have this assurance? How do we have this confidence of peace in the storm? It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we're no longer enemies of God, but come into peace with God. The gospel is actually really simple. The Bible says that the gospel is the power to save sinners. It's not just some words in the Bible. It's a literal power that will take us from death to life, unrest to peace with God. The gospel is this, that God created you and he created you perfectly. He didn't make a single mistake. He didn't make error. I know some of us think that God maybe messed up with us. Like, I think this eye is a little too squinty. Don't say amen. But God don't make junk. God is perfect. He created you perfectly, and he did it for one reason and one reason alone, so that you and I could be in right relationship with him. The Bible says that it's in him that we live, that we move, and that we have our being. So you were created perfectly by a perfect God to be in perfect relationship with him. If God is so good and God is so perfect, why is there such a storm on the inside of me? Why is there addiction? Why is there death? Why is there disease? Why is there cancer? Why is there chaos? Why did that thing happen to you when you were a kid? If God is good and perfect. It's really simple. It's sin. Sin is not some long list of things that you and I can and cannot do. Sin is anything outside of God's perfect design for your life. You see, God created me, therefore God alone has the authority to define what is good, right, perfect, and pleasing for my life. I didn't create myself, you didn't create yourself, therefore neither one of us get to decide what is good for us. My generation is the generation that says, hey, speak your truth. 
My generation is a generation that says, hey, if it feels good, it must be good. Let me just say this. Both of those are lies from the pit of hell. God created me, so God alone defines what is good for me. And every time we sin, doing something outside of God's design for our life, it brings brokenness into our world. That's why I have to talk about peace today. That's why we see addicts. That's why we see death. That's why we see disease. But let me be real. That's not the greatest area of brokenness in our lives. The greatest area of brokenness in our lives is when we sin, our relationship with God is broken. Remember, you were created perfectly by a perfect God to be in perfect relationship with him. And every time we sin, it breaks that relationship with God. The Bible talks about sin this way. It says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, because I've done things by my design and not God's, he must punishment. And that punishment is death. God would not be a perfect God if he didn't punish sin. Imagine this, you're driving home today, you get carjacked, and three weeks later, you get a summons in the mail, and the judge is saying, hey, come here, you go to court, you stand before the judge, you stand next to the carjacker, and the judge tells you that was his truth. The judge tells you that it felt good to him, so it must have been right for him. That's ridiculous, right? And in the same way, God being a good judge must punish sin. But what's great about this is, that's bad news. There's also good news. That same verse that says the wages of sin is death goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I deserve death for my sin, but I can have life in Jesus Christ. How do we go from death to life? It's all about Jesus, right? Jesus is God. Jesus was the one who spoke the earth into existence and then gave up his right to speak when he was born as a baby. We're going to celebrate that in just a few weeks. Then for the next 33 years of Jesus' life, he lived a perfect and a sinless life. He never held a grudge against somebody. He never was halfway obedient to the Father. He loved everyone that he encountered. He healed. He taught. He, he, he calmed the storms. He claimed to be the Son of God. And for it, the religious people of the day, they killed him. They hung him on a sinner's cross. They hung him on the cross that I deserve for my sin and that you deserve for your sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so he took on that punishment of sin and he was buried. For three days he was buried. And on the third day, the power of God, which now rests on the inside of every single one of us. Pastor Joe mentioned it earlier during our song champion, right? That power that lives inside of us raised Jesus from the dead. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some fable. This isn't something that you can read in Greek mythology class. More than 500 eyewitness accounts would give testimony to the resurrected, living, walking, talking, breathing, eating, teaching, being touched Jesus Christ. And when he rose from the dead, it proved this verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we go from chaos, turmoil, uh, enmity with God? How do we go from death because of sin into this life and peace that Jesus offers us? The Bible says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room, God's been speaking in countless ways. When you walk through the door, there are people holding the door with a beautiful smile on their face. When you went to the coffee station, the coffee was ministering to your soul. Somebody say amen to that. Come on. The worship team led us beautifully. Pastor Bobby shared scriptures. You saw what God is doing in this church. The message. There's a million ways that God's been speaking to our hearts today. I don't know what part of your day today that God has touched your heart. And you're saying, you know what? I'm not living a life of peace. I, have, no, I don't have peace with my past. I don't have peace with my present. I don't have peace with my future. But I want it. And you're saying, you know what, I've never heard the gospel presented like that. I, I, need to, I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to take this opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If that's you and you're saying, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to have that peace that you're talking about with God and with my past. I just want you on the count of three to lift up your hands if that's you. One, two, three. Raise them high if that's you. Anybody in this room? Thank you. Maybe you're in this room and at one time you had given your life to Jesus and now you're saying, you know what, I haven't really been living for God. He's really not the Lord of my life any longer. I'm kind of calling the shots for my life and I'm ready just to resubmit my life to God to make him Lord of my life again. You're saying, you know what, I want to come back to Jesus today. Uh, I want you to do the same thing on the count of three. Just lift up your hand. One, two, three, if that's you. Coming back to the Lord today. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, let's, as a grace family, say this prayer together. Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for living the life that I couldn't. 
And thank you for dying the death that I deserved. Thank you for being raised to life so I can have new and eternal life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, place your spirit within me, and make me that new creation. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, can you give it for those hands that responded? Amen. If you're, if you're a prayer team worker, can you come, come to the front? We want to spend a few moments praying with people. So if you're one of the part of the prayer team, could you join us? Hey, if you just said either one of those two prayers, maybe giving your life for the first time, or maybe you're recommitting your life for the second or third or fourth, whatever time, I want you to come down after service. Pastor Bobby's going to be down here. He wants to meet you. He's going to help you grow. The rest of this team here wants to help you grow, figure out your next steps. And so your next step right now is to take that step forward and meet Pastor Bobby uh, down here. Uh, we have some prayer team members here. I want to take a few moments while the, the team leads us here and, and pray over some of those needs. In a room this size, in a holiday season like this, there is undoubtedly people in this room who don't have peace. And I'm just here to tell you that there's a, a power in an agreement. Matthew 18, verses 18, tells us, if any two would touch and agree on anything, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven, whatever you bound in heaven will be bound on earth, and whatever you ask for in my name, my Father in heaven will hear you and give it to you. So there's power in saying, you know what? I don't have peace right now. I, I want to come and I want to agree that the peace of God would be a guard for me, would guard my heart and my mind. That's what the Bible teaches, what? Uh, submit your cares to God, right? To, through prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? So if you don't have peace with your past, I felt like this is, these are three areas that we need peace in. We need peace with our past. Some of you have walked through some pretty traumatic things. I, in my life, had walked through some pretty traumatic things. And it was the peace of God that allowed me to heal and to overcome and have peace with things that I had done in my past and things that had been done to me in my past. And in the same way, prayer with these people can help you have peace with your past. Peace with your, your present. A lot of us are probably wondering, what am I going to do next? What's, what's, what, what's my next step? I just lost my job. What am I going to do? Like, a lot of times, we don't have peace with what's happening right now. You're in the middle of a storm. Maybe your family member is strung out. I don't know what your circumstance is. But God wants to give you peace for your present. And then finally, peace for your future. One of the great, I've spent a lot of years working with young people, and they're always trying to figure out, what am I, college am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? What? Like, there's an anxiety and a lack of peace about what a future, our future would hold. But what I know this is that the Bible says that in God, all things are held together. The earth is held together. And if he can hold the earth together, he can hold your future together. Amen. Is that good? So um, they're going to lead us. I'm going to say a prayer over you, and then these team is open. Uh, but can we all just lift our hands? I just want to pray over you right now. Come on. I, I just want to declare peace. I want to prophesy peace over your heart and over your mind. God, I thank you right now for every person in this room. I thank you, Lord, that supernatural peace is available to every one of them. So now in the name of Jesus, I speak to every heart that is anxious. I speak to every mind that is anxious, and I declare the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ over them right now. Holy Spirit, begin to move and to minister, God, in a fresh in a new way. I pray for ones who are concerned about the past, the things that are happening. God, I pray that there would no longer be sleepless nights as to what has taken place. There'd be no longer sleepless nights as to what's happening right now. There'd no longer be sleepless nights as to what is happening in the future, God. We know your name, so we choose to trust you now. In Jesus' name, team, could you lead us? And these altars are open for prayer.